Good morning, church. Today is the Lord's Day, and uh, thank you guys for showing up early. Uh, and let's, uh, let's uh, start this morning by standing up together. And we're going to start by worshiping our Lord and Savior this morning through this song. Join us.
I heard it was a great week. I wasn't there last week, but <clears throat> um, last week we got to have summer Bible camp, and it was a great week. It, we didn't get to do it last year. It had been two years since we got to do summer Bible camp. And so it was just this whole stage was transformed. This room was transformed. And so thank you to all the volunteers who helped prepare it, the design team leading up to it, Hope, and the crew leaders, and everybody that was involved. It was an awesome week to get to see kids just sing to Jesus. Um, <clears throat> it, 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 it was, this is why we're here. And it was awesome. So uh, that was last week. Uh, in another announcement for you, July 10th is a work day coming up. Uh, so this is an opportunity. There'll be people outside in green shirts, I think, where you can sign up for. This will be an opportunity to come and help care for the property. You know how moms and dads always make, you know, kids do chores around the house and take care of the house. And because you're family, it's part of the job, right? We're family. And part of our role as family is helping care for this property. And so mark that day out on your calendar. Come out. There'll be donuts and coffee and all that kind of stuff. And you might be lucky and get to use a power tool. I don't know. Don't, uh, don't write my name down that I've said that that will happen because uh, then Bobby will probably come and yell at me. Um, but come out and help care for our property. Last week, a lot of kids touched a lot of things, and so there are handprints everywhere, right? Uh, but uh, So sign up for that. On your way in, obviously, you should have gotten a little card on it. You can find out what else is going on in the life of the church, as well as register your attendance with us, uh, giving online, and prayer requests. We say this every week because it, it, it matters to us. We love to pray for the church. And if you fill out a prayer request, you can mark it, whether it's just the pastors or the staff or the whole church. But as a family, our call is to pray for each other, to lift each other up. And so take advantage of that. Take advantage of the brothers and sisters in Stonebridge that want to pray for you and walk alongside you. As we begin our worship service this morning, Lamentations 3 22 and 23 says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. His mercies never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We gather today because of his great love. Because his compassion is new this morning. Because his mercies are new this morning. Because of his faithfulness. That word compassion there, or mercies, depending on your translation, the, the Hebrew, it's, it's a tender love. It's a motherly love that he has for us. And it's not because of you that he loves you. It's because of what Jesus has done. And we gather to celebrate Jesus to celebrate the one who lived the life that we couldn't, who died the death that we deserve, and rise again so that we can call him Abba, Father. And so that's why we gather this morning in worship. Now, one of the first things we're going to do this morning is uh, honor our graduating high school seniors. And so if that's you, I know who you are. You know who you are. Come up to the stage. I know you're here. I know you're here. There you are. <clears throat> we have a lot of them. Some of them could be here. Some of them couldn't be here. So come on. Yep. Up, up, up. I know. Now you get to feel what it feels like to be in the spotlight. And it's awkward. I get it. it yeah. Yeah. So this is a significant moment for you guys, and you're going to probably, you probably have heard at graduations and things like that, things about next steps and the significance with which it is, but we wanted to take this time as your church family to honor you and to say congratulations and to encourage you that whatever you set off to do next, I'm always reminded of the words that Paul wrote to Timothy. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. You have the opportunity to be an example to us on what it means to follow Christ in these next steps that you move into. And so I encourage you, get plugged in, get connected with a Christian community. If you're moving away to another college, whatever's next for you, 
Find community and know that you've got a call to reflect Christ to that community, not only your peers, but to us old people, right? So we do have a gift for you, and uh, so when we're done and we pray, exit this way, and Andrew will give you your gift, and, uh, but he's going to take a moment to pray for you. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for these seniors, and I just pray that as they go out from here into this next stage of life, that you would continue to watch over them, and that you would continue to um, build their relationship with you stronger every day. Um, I pray for their parents. Uh, I know this can be a, a hard time for them as they uh, uh, move their kids into this next stage, that you would just give them peace and that they would trust in you. Um, and like Tim said, that they would find community wherever they go, that you would provide that community for them. And I just thank you for the time that, uh, as short as it is, that I've gotten to spend with some of these students. And um, I just thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's welcome them. Or not welcome them. Sorry. Congratulate them. Oh, you guys can... Thank you guys. First service, we welcomed new members, and so that's why I said welcome there. So we're sending you guys off is what we're, what we're doing. We're going to uh, take some time now to sing in worship and sing about his faithfulness. So if you will please stand and join us in song.
you to think right now about God's faithfulness and not the big idea about his faithfulness, but, but something that he's done specifically for you that he's shown his faithfulness. It may be something, a tiny little thing, but he loves you. He cares about you. So think about something that he has done for you to show you his faithfulness because we can trust in him. He walks beside you. He walks with us. Have that in your mind as we sing this next song together. forever is a friend of mine. Does that amaze you? It amazes me that I can call him friend. 
you know, we come to a point in our service where we take time to pray for the tithes and the offerings, but also to, to just pray out of gratitude and to, to confess the way how we sing about great is his faithfulness, and yet, Lord, I'm faithless. I need you, Lord. And we pray for our tithes and our offerings because God uses those to further his kingdom. It's not about Stonebridge. We pray that all the time. It's about him. It's about his name going forth and his work being done and drawing people to himself. So we're going to take a moment and we're going to pray. And then we'll move into the sermon. Heavenly Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you reign forever and we have that promise and you're also my friend. Lord, I confess to you the ways in which I forget that, the ways in which I willfully ignore that, the ways in which I care about really just what I want. Lord, we confess those to you, and we know that you, you have paid for them. And we know that in you, Christ, we are whole. We have been made perfect. So, Lord, as we give you our tithes and our offerings, we pray, Lord, that you would use them to further your kingdom. Use them to further your name. Lord, may out of our gratitude, out of a heart of thankfulness, May we offer back in worship a small portion of the great grace that you have lavished upon us. And Lord, may you use that by this little part of your bride to point people to you, to build bridges of grace, and to advance your kingdom. In the saving name of Jesus we pray. Amen. The scripture this morning is from Psalm 3. Hear the word of the Lord. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Let's uh, go to the Lord one more time in prayer to pray for this time now together. Heavenly Father, what a thought to call again our Creator, Father. Lord, today we gather to worship you, to live out what you made us to do, to glorify you, to enjoy you. Lord, we don't deserve that. Lord, our sin and our rebellion, rightly so, deserves justice and judgment. And yet you poured that out upon Christ. You reconciled us to you through Christ. Thank you. Lord, forgive us for how easily we lose sight of that. May we be amazed by that. May it foster in us and you foster in us a, a, an attitude of thankfulness, a gratitude, of gratitude, a heart bent towards joy. Lord, I, I need that. That was your prayer for us in John 17, that we would have the full measure of joy that the Father and the Son experience. It's because of this amazing news. Lord, now as we turn to Psalm 3, your word today, I pray you would guide us. I pray you would train us to live your way. I pray you would work in our hearts, revealing the idols that we're so prone to follow. 
Lord, reveal the ways in which we fall prey to fear, the ways in which we fall prey to anxiety, to worry, to, to looking too intently to the things unfolding around us and the things unfolding within us rather than looking to you. Focusing upon you, Jesus. May your power today, Jesus, help us to trust you more and more and to live into the peace that is ours in you, Jesus. It's by your saving name we pray. Amen. Well, it's good to be back up here with you all. It's been a while. The last time I preached was mid-April, and uh, it's, it's nice to to be here. That was due to a last-minute trip that I had to make to California in May. Uh, my, <clears throat> my mom's health is not doing well, and we had to bring in hospice when, when I was out there. And so I would appreciate your continued prayers as we navigate this, this part of her journey and, and our journey as a family. In fact, my family's flying out there Friday to visit her and to celebrate her uh, 75th birthday, whether she's with us or not. And I really look forward to it. And my guess is right now my dad is watching. And so I'm saying, hi, dad. Hi, mom. Um, I am both deeply, um, I'm grateful for the impact that you've had on my life, my family's. <clears throat> I've, I have uh, turned the corner so I don't cry. Uh, I have, uh, too late, two older brothers as well, and we get along really well. We, we enjoy each other's company. We, uh, in fact, we were doing a book study together, and we, just, we, we enjoy being together as brothers, and uh, we're all going to be together for this trip, and so it's exciting. It wasn't always that way for sure. I'm sure you can remember back to when you had younger siblings or older siblings and you were in the house. You guys probably didn't get along, but we do now. And this isn't just because I'm reminiscing today and wanting to share my family life with you, although I'm happy to and, and happy to ask for your prayers for us as we, again, walk through this, this journey. But as we look at Psalm 3, it's the first psalm with, an, with a, a description, with a context given for why it was written. And David didn't have the best family. It, Absalom was trying to kill him in this psalm. And we'll get a little bit into, in, more into that. But again, his family life was not the best. And, and I do think sometimes perspective can help, right? You might not get along with your brothers and sisters. It's probably not this bad, right? <laughs> That's not to dismiss what's happening and, and the hardship and the difficulty that it is, but sometimes perspective can help. And I think what's amazing in this psalm is in this moment, in with what's happening unfold around him, what does he do? What does David do in this moment? And we're going to get into that, but before I get into that, I thought, I thought it might be helpful to sketch out a basic outline that we often see in the psalms around these types of psalms. This is called a lament psalm. And, and, and you see a typical structure that follows in, in the Psalms. And the reason I draw attention to this is because I think it would inform our prayer life. My encouragement is it would form the way in which we talk to Jesus, the way in which we commune with the Father. If the Psalms are our prayers, are our songs, I pray that they will begin to inform and structure your own prayers. And a lament psalm, often as an, as an introduction, is a direct plea, a direct cry to God of the anguish, of, of the distressed, of, of the depressed, of everything that's happening in your life. The depressed call on God, the, the distressed and the oppressed call on God directly, looking to him to deliver, looking to him to respond. It's a cry that rises out of need, out of dependence, out of pain, and out of anguish. Have you ever had prayers like this? Probably at some point in your life. I know I have. Walking through the departure of Rick, the, the challenges of pastoring during COVID, the decline of my mom. But over and over and over again, what you see in the Psalms is this, this crying out, this, this, this direct plea, but it then followed by a continued conversation with him with God, because is there anyone else mighty enough to save? Is there anyone else mighty enough to sustain? No. He's the one that's able to do it. 
So from there, the, the author often then kind of rehearses the narrative, goes through the story. It's not because God doesn't know what's happening. It's not because he, he, he doesn't see what's happening. But again, it's flowing out of a, Lord, this is happening, and I don't understand why it's happening, but here's, here's what it looks like. And yet, even in the retelling of the problem, even in the rehearsing of the narrative, the psalmist runs towards God rather than from him. He might not understand the context of what's happening, and it might not be great, but he runs towards him. During these moments, there is honesty. There is vulnerability. There is transparency with God. All the emotions come out in, the, in these psalms. All the emotions that the psalmist is feeling from anger, from frustration, to despair, to sorrow, to joy, to all of these things. And, and I think what's key to acknowledge here is it's okay to acknowledge our feelings. The psalms give us permission to acknowledge our feelings, to acknowledge the struggle, to acknowledge the pain, the frustration, the anger. That's what verse 7 is. Verse 7, when, he, when he, he, he prays out, strike all my enemies on the jaw, break the teeth of the wicked. It's a crying out of, Lord, I'm angry and I'm frustrated and, and I'm in despair of all of what's happening and bring your justice and judgment. So in the Psalms, we see a permission to acknowledge our feelings. And yet what we also will see is it's not licensed to act upon them. The psalmist leaves justice, leaves judgment, leaves vindication, correction in the hands of God. Think about 1 Peter, right? We just finished up 1 Peter, and this is why, why Peter can write in 3.9, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, rather repay evil with blessing. This is why Paul can write in Romans 12, beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. Take it to him. Let, take it to God. The series is called Honest to God. Be honest with God but we leave it with him. I know, I know a verse like seven, and we'll, I'll talk about it briefly now and then get into the other parts, can kind of some, make us squirm a little bit and that, that he would pray this about it. But you imagine, again, the emotional response of, if, if he's crying out for justice, for judgment to happen to him and leaves it with him, he's leaving it in the right hands. But there is some truth to it in the fact that, look, church, our hope lies in the coming of Christ and his victory over his enemies, but it's his victory. And from those places of crying out, from those places of laying it out, the psalmist then declares the promises of God. He then praises God. He turns his attention to God, the confidence he has in God. All this is to say and to encourage you that God can take it. Our prayer should be informed by these psalms as we go through and, and learn and add this into your own prayer life. The key is to take it to God. Honesty with him. Followed by running to him in dependence. Now, Psalm 3, as I said briefly, the context of Psalm 3, Psalm 3 is a family in ruin. A nation divided. It's, it's, it's enemies within the people of God. It's not enemies outside. It's not the Persians. It's, it's not the Babylonians. It's, it's not the enemies outside Israel. It's the enemies within the kingdom itself. And if you want to read more about the story, the background for this psalm, you can find it in 2 Samuel chapters 15 through 19. You can read, I'll just briefly tell a little bit about it. In this moment, Absalom is now going after the throne. A few years earlier, he's killed his brother, and now he's eyeing the throne. And the way he goes about it is he stands around, and, and, and before people come in to see the king, he's kind of like, the king can't help you, but I can and he wins the people, the, the hearts of the people over, and then he leads them in rebellion. And we're told in these chapters in, in, in 2 Samuel that David had to run out of the city. He was weeping, he was barefoot, and his head was covered. He didn't see it coming. And we're even told that as he's going out, people that, anybody that had a bone to pick with David, anybody that had a grudge against him, used this opportunity 
to lob their insults, to lob their, their harm at him, to, to, to come up and go, now's our chance. Now is our opportunity. So David is running out of the, the, the kingdom, fleeing for his life as there's division in his house. I do think there's pertinent application here in this moment. I mean, if you were here for when Richard Pratt pe- preached two weeks ago, he spoke, spoke about how, how churches have been asking him to come and, and preach, and they've been asking him to speak about the division that they're seeing in the church because we are seeing the same division. We're falling prey to the same lies of culture and politics, and it's, and it's happening within churches, within the people of God. So that's the context with which David writes this, verses 1 and 2. Many are my foes. It's not a question. How many are my foes? It's just how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. The heart question, every time I I preach, I'm always like, Lord, what? What do I need to wrestle with? What's the heart question? What, where, where in my heart do I need to be open to the working of your spirit to reveal idols in my heart? And, and the question I think is, Lord, have I been a foe to my own family? Have I been an enemy to my own people? And wrestling with the way in which we as the bride of Christ, as the family, interact with each other. So the context that David pens this psalm and what he outlines here is he acknowledges the foes that he faces. Then he turns to the God that he confesses and then the peace he enjoys and finally the help he expects. So again, in verse one and two, David cries out as he sees more and more people turning against him. And in verse two, they're taunting him. God's not gonna deliver you. They begin taunting him and making fun of him. And and, and the key here is not that God can't deliver him. Their words are, God will not deliver you. It's not that God can't do it. They're saying that God has abandoned you, David. God doesn't love you anymore. See, the kingdom's turned on you. You're not God's anointed anymore. And, and, and while we might not face the same enemies that David faced in this moment, the tactic of the enemies are all too familiar to us, aren't they? Words have power. Think for a minute the power of words when someone has said something to you that has hurt and wounded you that, that you still remember. I remember a few of the things that people have said to me in middle school and high school. That old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but what? Words will never hurt me. Is that true? I know students grasp this. Over the years, talking to students through middle school and and hearing the things that other people have said to them and to each other and and the wound that, that, that is carried from that, how much more when they strike at the very core of a person, the God who anointed you, who said he loves you, doesn't love you anymore. It hurts. And so he cries out to God, Lord, this is what they're saying. They're saying, you will not deliver me. And in the midst of this, we learn an important tool with which David moves from verses 1 and 2 to 3 and 4. He takes a grammatical 180. He begins to take his focus off of the enemies and set them on God. So there's a lot of you, you're not my enemies, but there's, there's a lot of you in here in this room, right? <clears throat> so he's looking around and he's seeing a lot of people. He's seeing the people that are surrounding him and he says, there, there's a lot of them, Lord, look and see. But I'm gonna focus on you. I'm going to look to you. How, how often do we lose focus of him and get focused on the things in the world around us. Have you ever had those moments where you're just kind of dazing off and all of a sudden you realize you're staring at someone, but you really weren't staring at them, but they're like, why are you staring at me, man? Well, I I wasn't, right? 
Or there'll be times where I'm, I'm, I'm talking to my sons and the talk's going on a little too long and, and you know that they're just kind of staring at you, but they're really not listening, right? And so you're like, okay, did you hear what I said? Do you understand? Yes. Okay, what did I say? <laughs> right? It, it, the, the, the focus shifts. There's a, a, another silly example is uh, in the 90s, right? Do you remember Magic Eye? Do you remember those computer-generated 3D images? That's a dolphin, by the way. If, if, it really is. I'm not messing with anybody. If you're able to... to in order to see these things, you, you have to kind of unfocus your eyes. You kind of kind of blur your eyes in order to see the 3D image in there. And, and, and that's kind of what happens when, when, when you lose focus of him, your eye... You, 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 the world around you begins to be too consuming and you look, you focus on something too long and it skews your view. It skews, I'm gonna get rid of that so it's not a distraction, so that you can focus here. But that's what happens when we lose sight of who our God is. We begin to get overwhelmed by what's unfolding around us, overwhelmed by the things that are happening. Uh, another silly example, I, I use a physical planner uh, to schedule out my weeks. I'm, I'm analog, I'm old school. And um, uh, so I'll be working on the week, what I've got going on next week. And oh, man, I got, I got a busy week next week. And then I'll look at the next week. Oh man, I've got a busy week that week. And then, oh man, I, that week's busy too. Oh man, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, and you get into this cycle of being overwhelmed because you've got, you realize I, it, it's going to be December before I take a vacation day. It, and you just kind of get this overwhelmed snowball feeling. It's not that I need to unfocus in that moment. I need to shift my focus. And David shifts his focus in this psalm from the many surrounding him to the God who is surrounding all of them. It's what we're saying, the God of angel armies. There's the story, in, I think it's in 2 Kings, where the, the people of God are surrounded and Elijah's with uh, his, his buddy, his friend, and, 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 and his friend is like, oh my gosh, this army's huge. They're, they're going to destroy us. And Elijah's like, <laughs> God, show them. And, and his eyes are open and he sees the hills full of the angels of the Lord. When your focus shifts from the many surrounding to the God surrounding you, you can make it through the difficulty. This answer we see is given over and over and over again in Scripture. Overwhelmed? Remember who God is. You anxious? Remember who God is. Are you hurting? Remember who God is. Are you lonely? Remember who God is. Are you fearful, surrounded, angry, resentful, bitter, all of it? Remember who God is. And that's what he does. That's what David does. He remembers that God is a protecting God. You, Lord, are a shield around me. Think of like Captain America's shield, right? That'll stop anything. Well, I guess I finally did see the last Marvel movie and it, it did kind of crumble a little bit. Yeah, I, I saw it finally. When did it come out? 10 years ago? Ah, I'm a little late to the game. But you, you, the, the shield, God's protection. You also see, he says, he's the lifter of my head. He says, my glory, Lord, the the one who lifts my head. In the ancient Near East, that was a sign of honor. That was a sign of respect, of dignity. When, the, when you would come into the king, your head would be bowed. And, and if he would lift your head, he said, I see you. I value you. And he lifts David's head. And then David remembers the accessibility of God. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. He's not way off distant, not answering people. He hears my cry, even on his holy mountain. David remembers all of these things about God and about who he is, and it's all based upon who God is, not who David is. That's the key. That's the perspective. It's about who God is. It's about who he has revealed himself to be. Sometimes we need to shift our focus. Sometimes we need a perspective change. Another example in Numbers 13, the, the Israelites were outside of the land of Canaan, 
and they were getting ready to go in. But there were 12 spies that Moses and them sent in. And so you might be familiar with this story. There were 12 people that went in to check it out, to check out the land of Canaan. And when they come back, they had to report out. And 10 of them were like, they, they were big people. Uh, that uh, that really strong armies, big cities, big walls. Guys, I don't think this is a good idea. But two of them saw the same people, saw the same army, saw the same city, saw the same places, but they kept their perspective on who their God was. And they said, if the Lord's given us this land, the Lord's given us this land. From, from this place, from, from gazing upon God, from remembering who he has revealed himself to be in the Bible, David's able to say in verse 5, I lie down and sleep because the Lord sustains me. I'll wake again. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. The Hebrew in, in that really could be translated, as far as I'm concerned, I will lie down and sleep. As far as I'm concerned, God's got this. He's in control. There's a trust there. There's a peace there. There's a joy there that David enjoys that I know can seem surreal, can seem fleeting, can seem hard to grasp. And that's why we go back again and again and again to the promises that God has revealed and completed in Scripture. Maybe you remember as a child, I remember during a big thunderstorm, or maybe I had a nightmare. Maybe you remember this, or if you've got young kids now, it's happening now. Uh, I, I remember when there was a big thunderstorm, or, or I had a nightmare, the safest place for me to be was next to mom or dad on the floor. I was really lucky if I was able to get in between mom and dad up on the bed. No monsters getting me there. It doesn't make logical sense, right, that that's safer than where I was in my bedroom. But, but you all remember that, right? The peace and the safety and the comfort that you felt simply by being on the side of the bed where mom and dad were. That's the peace that we currently enjoy in our God because what does the Scripture teach us? God dwells in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's got you. I will lie down and sleep, and I will not fear because he's got me, because of who God is. So verse 3, but God. It's one of those, this is who you are, God. And verse 5 is, therefore I will. I get this can be hard to experience. I get it can be hard to wrap our heads around. Because the question that often jumps up or we ponder is, well, I, my mom's still going to die. I still might lose my job. My friends have still said hurtful things about me. David was still in the desert when he said, I will lie down and sleep. The promise of deliverance is not from the suffering, from the difficulty, but through it. We talk about this, right, over and over again. It's, it's through the difficulty. It's peace in the midst of the difficulty. Again, we see in Scripture, God doesn't always deliver us like he did David in this moment. Peter was freed from prison. An angel came and freed him from prison. In Acts, James, the brother of John, is, hey, was, was killed. And what feeds us and teaches us in these moments is reliance upon that God knows what he's doing and he is guarding us. He is caring for us. And really, in this psalm, we see the model of a greater king. We see the model of Christ. Just as David was rejected by his people, rejected as a king and taunted, Jesus was rejected by his people. Jesus was rejected as king and he was taunted on the cross by his enemies. See, in Jesus' death and burial and resurrection, God brings, verse 8, he brings salvation, he brings deliverance, he brings blessing through the suffering. And so in this psalm, we see a pattern of Christ. We see how his suffering led to glory because God sustained him through death. And then we have the promises to hang on that he's going to do the same for us. 
Romans 6, 5, for if we've been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. See, enemies may abound. Friends may reject you. Family may hurt you, may turn against you, but the promise of Christ stands upon who he is, not upon who you are or who they are. And so we can say, I will lie down and sleep because he sustains Paul says it differently elsewhere. He says, he who raised Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and bring us into his presence. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. When our focus is shifted, to him, we can live without fear. Perfect love casts out fear. We can see what's happening in the world around us, in our own lives and in our family, as light and momentary affliction. We can give it to him. I think about my mom, my own mom, and the death that she's facing. And even though there's sorrow in my heart, because of Christ, I know and she knows it's a light and momentary affliction. The promise of Jesus still stands. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Paul says, no. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. My prayer for you today, my encouragement for you today, is that these psalms would be prayers for us. To know that you can take to God anything, but continue the conversation with him. Continue to run to him. Continue to shift your focus off of what's unfolding and to him. And I challenge you this week, every day, Read Psalm 3. And next week, read Psalm 4. But this week, read Psalm 3. And put yourself in there. Praying through it. Reminding yourself who God is. The God that we confess. And I pray his peace would be upon us. I pray your, his peace would be upon you. And you would be more aware of his presence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that we are yours. Thank you that by your blood shed for us, you have secured us, sealed us to be yours. May we not lose sight of that. May we continually remember that no matter what our sinful hearts, no matter what the world throws at us. When the enemy whispers in our ear, you've been faithless. You're not good enough. May we turn to you and say, I don't have to be because of him. We thank you for that, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. We come to this table, and it represents verse 8 in the psalm. It represents ultimate deliverance, ultimate blessing. It represents the thing that he's crying out for, that David is praying for. But it's important to understand that before we've placed our faith in Jesus Christ, our trust in Jesus, we're the enemies that David is fleeing from. We're the enemies of God. Paul writes in Romans 5.10, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. When we profess faith in Jesus Christ, we have been reconciled by Jesus' death. And what we do here today is to remember that, celebrate that, honor that, and receive special grace to know that we are no longer enemies of God, we are friends of God. That's why we often say that this table is for 
whether you're, uh, this is not Stonebridge's table, this is the Lord's table, and this is for those who profess faith in Jesus Christ. This is for those who, as Paul writes in Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, have called on the name of the Lord. And if you're not there yet, if you haven't professed faith in Jesus yet, that's okay. We want you to. But don't take the elements. Instead, take time to ponder who this God is that would send his son to do what we couldn't and to rise again from the dead. This morning, what we're going to do is you're going to come forward to the tables, and you'll get the bread here, and we encourage you, stop for a moment and, and, and take the bread up at the table, remembering that Christ died for you individually, that you, he has reconciled you through his son. But then you'll be given the cup and hang on to that and take it back to your seat, and we're going to take that together because you alone are not the bride of Christ. You need the people around you. We are the bride of Christ. And so we'll take the cup together after a little bit of time. And if you're unable to come forward, if it's, if it's too difficult for you to, to get up and move and, and, and to come forward, simply raise your hand and, and one of our servers will come around and, and provide the elements for you there in your seat. But now let's ponder the words and then we'll pray and go ahead and ushers come to your table as I'm reading the words of institution. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we do this, we're saying, I need you, Jesus. My faith is in you. My trust is in you. This is a proclamation of our trusting in his death. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may you use these common elements, this common bread, this common juice, may you use it to nourish us. May you use it to remind us of who our God is, who our King is, and of your great love. And by that, we are not consumed. In your name we pray. Amen.
Brothers and sisters, taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, just as we need food and drink to nourish us physically, how much more do we need you? Nourish us spiritually today. Remind us of how great our God is. May we experience the glory of your goodness. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand and finish the song with us. Experience the glory of his goodness. I pray that was you this morning, and I pray that throughout this week you would experience the glory of his goodness because our God is good, and he loves us deeply. If you're in need of prayer, again, don't hesitate to fill out the, 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 the prayer request, and we've got cards on walls and things like that too if you'd rather handwrite them. We love praying for you. Uh, this also is the end of the month, and so there is a new table talk. For anybody that likes to utilize those, you can find those on the table out there. And now receive the Lord's blessing as you go. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, may he equip you with everything good, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight. And all God's children said, amen. amen.